Please join me in welcoming Dave Trabert and Paul Suter to the Wichita Acting Club. Good afternoon, everyone. The name of the video uh, you're going to see is Giving Kids uh, a Fighting Chance. And, and to set this up, this is a slide you've probably seen uh, before here or in some of our publications. Uh, the red and blue line tracks reading proficiency on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. That's a test that uh, all 50 states participate in. Kansas first uh, started doing it in 1998, and that's why we start there. As you can see, reading proficiency has actually declined. Uh, now about a third of our kids in fourth and eighth grade are reading proficiently. At the same time, the orange line is showing how much spending per pupil would have increased if it had been increased for inflation. It would have gone from about $7,000 per pupil to $10,000. The green line shows you what it actually did. It actually was over $14,000 per pupil last year. So there's just no comparison between that, uh, that, that really dispels that myth that spending more money is what drives achievement. And it's the same thing that we see, pretty almost identical picture on the national average. Uh, the only difference here is we don't have, uh, it takes a couple of years uh, for the, the funding numbers to come out. So we only have through 2017 for the national, but it's basically the same picture. And this is the battle that we've been fighting uh, over the years, that relationship of money and achievement. Look at the remarkable difference here the red lines uh, are what the scores were in 1998 and the blue lines in 2019. This is proficiency level for low income kids. The dip, look at the difference between what Florida did and what the national average did. Florida has seen, I'll just do the fourth grade to get into this quickly, 133% gain, uh, where the national average went up 62%. So that's good. Uh, but just remarkable, and it wasn't just the low income, we see very similar things on the kids who are not low income. Florida is just blowing past uh, the nation. And so we wanted to tell the story because last year, uh, we shot this last year, uh, Paul and his team uh, did the, all the video and the digital work. We sent, uh, they went to Florida uh, and produced this documentary so we could tell the story. Of, of what they did that made this tremendous difference because we want to be able to provide hope that, that the same things can happen here in Kansas and in other states if we have the courage to do what they did. This is about 35 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and start this. And of course, there's a celebrity in the room to recognize in this uh, video. Quality education that's right for a child opens a bright future. Without that quality education, a child is on a path of uncertainty and failure. This is the civil rights issue of our time, it's the economic issue of our times, it's the social justice issue of our time. Political leaders need to get off the mat and start advocating more meaningful reforms so that there's rising student achievement so that dreams can come true. During the time that Florida uh, did these reforms. Kansas really didn't do much, if anything. We're spending over half of our budget on K-12 education. Just throwing more money uh, at schools without any accountability and without uh, good policy that has been proven to be successful in other states isn't going to get the job done. Reform has to take place in, in Kansas if we're going to produce productive students that are able to carry the state and get it where it is supposed to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years and beyond. We've seen all the data, we did all the studies. Now we need somebody to be courageous. 
What are you doing if you're not reforming the things to assure that the next generation has a fighting chance in this incredibly challenging and competitive world that we're moving towards? So in 1998, I ran for governor saying that we needed to change our public education system. And I laid out a plan to do so. In 1999, um, I got a chance to work with the Florida legislature to implement probably the most meaningful suite of reforms uh, up till then that the, that the country had seen. We graded schools A through F. We gave school recognition dollars out for schools that showed improvement. We gave vouchers out for schools that were failing. And the net effect of all this was a turbulent time, certainly, but we turned the system upside down. And it was based on, literally as a candidate, going to visit 250 schools in a way that uh, put a human context around this. Uh, i never forget uh, going to Seminole High School where a kid was preparing to take the high school graduation test and it required an eighth grade level aptitude. And he couldn't answer a question I'm looking over his shoulders, which was a baseball game started at three and ended at 4.30, how long was the game? If you have enough of those examples of just uh, imagining what his world would look like going forward where we had these incredibly low expectation, no consequence between excellence and failure, no consequence between mediocrity and improvement, and it just kind of fueled me to be bigger and bolder, uh, and the legislature went along with it, which I'm very grateful for. And that started us on a journey of perpetual reform in the state of Florida. It was clear to me that the future for children as adults uh, would be dramatically better if we assured that they had a chance to learn, to learn how to read and to be able to acquire knowledge. Today, it is even a bigger deal. The net effect of this was we have rising student achievement in Florida that is the envy of many places in the country. The NAEP test, which is the nation's report card in 1998, Florida on the fourth grade reading test was 29th out of 31. There were two states worse. Uh, people could basically whisper, thank God for Florida because we were so, so poor. Ten years later, after ending social promotion in third grade, the largest uh, voucher program in the country, expanding charters, creating a, a, a focus on early childhood literacy, all of the combined efforts of the suite of reforms allowed us on 10 years later in 2007 to have a NAEP test where we were sixth out of 50 states. Florida's low-income kids are in the top two or three, Hispanic kids similarly, and African-American kids. And so when you have these kind of, when you have this kind of success, it starts to sound like you're whining when you're opposed to this stuff because it looks like you're for the economic interests of the adults rather than rising student achievement for children. The idea was to make, create accountability in a totally transparent way and in education there's, there's one real simple way of doing it which is grade schools based on student learning A, B, C, D, and F and do it in an intellectually solid way, if you will. Don't do it um, simply based on proficiency, but reward improvement, learning gains. So the accountability was one of the things uh, that came into being because the people were questioning our motivation. What they found out is that because we were about educating the children first, then accountability was more important to us because we had to demonstrate that we were focusing on the children, not dismantling the system. So once we set up an accountability process, it forced them into being accountable to themselves. Um, it was accountability for teachers to make sure that their children performed. Uh, it's grading of schools because Parents didn't necessarily know that their children were going to schools that um, the majority of those children were not graduating or moving to the next grade fully prepared. And we all know by the time you get to the third grade, if you haven't learned to read, 
oftentimes you just get moved along and you never learn to read. We had children graduating from high school and taking our entry level exams into our, what was then the community college system, now became our state, our state college system, and they couldn't pass it. But they had a Florida high school diploma that said that they were fully qualified and ready to go to community college. We had to make a change and it was the future of our children. I have two boys. One of them, he's fine in a public school setting and he's able to work very well, do his work and, and you know, he doesn't have any major issues, he's happy. And then I have another child that needs extra support, uh, that will need extra resources that the school cannot provide. In my child's case, he has a sensory processing disorder and I've, I've experienced how teachers get frustrated with him and then just, instead of making it an issue about what his condition is or his ability to learn in a certain environment, uh, they make it into a discipline issue. So we need to make sure that we, each child, every child has an opportunity to compete in a global marketplace because that's our reality. That wasn't our reality 20 years ago. Let's say, for example, my school were not here and the neighborhood schools that we have are failing schools. They are D's and F's for years. Did these students have a choice? These parents do not, have, even if we open up choices and say, all righty, these students can go into other magnet schools, can apply at other places. Do the parents have the means to take them? They are hardly making ends meet. So these students are destined to go into the zone schools based upon the neighborhood zip code. Now, middle school is also an underperforming school. And then moving from underperforming school, middle school to high school, they're all failing. Where are these children going? Most of these students are not going to graduate. But with this choice, this little school, Women Academy, it opened up in this area. Now, 300 plus students have the opportunity to attend the school. It makes a big difference. Now these students are passing out of an A school. Middle school magnet applications go out and these school students are selected into programs that they never thought even existed. So they have more choices. They have more options. And most of these students have gone into magnet schools and are doing extremely well. We keep up with it they already are on their college path. Charter schools have to perform in order to survive. Charter schools have to show the results in order to stay in the business. We have to get student enrollment. We have to, for our finances, for student enrollment, we have to have the buy-in from the parents. We have to show results to the parents and only then they'll enroll. Public schools, not the same thing. So with charter schools, public schools get a push. It does extend to the individual student, then it extends to the individual school, then it extends to all of the other schools, and then all of the other students began to say, wow, what's going on over there? If I can go down the street and get this kind of return, if I don't want everybody to go down the street, I better figure out how to give equal return where I am. Now, if districts are losing students to the charter schools, what is their only option to get those students back? Compete, right? To get to par with the charter school results. And here, alternative choices are given to the students. More alternative choices. And more students benefit out of it. We are just competing to keep our students here. But students are benefiting. They have so many other choices which fit their needs. It's important to fund the reforms. Normally what you do is to say, okay, you got the base funding and then any new idea is on top of that and that's vulnerable to cuts if there's a downturn. We funded the reforms first. We rewarded the schools that showed um, progress with the bottom 25% of their student body. We provided uh, for every, every kid that passed an AP class, that was an additional bonus for the school grade. We bonus teachers who teach courses that uh, where kids pass AP and IB and these nationally recognized Cert certification program. So our, our accountability system is aligned towards more of what we want, which is rising student achievement. And we fund it. The largest bonus program for teachers in the United States is the school recognition dollars that, that exist in our, in our accountability system. Every school that is an A or shows improvement 
gets $100 per student directly to the, to the uh, wire transfer directly into the school. No cuts by the bureaucracy. And there are celebrations when schools have this kind of success. Uh, and 90% of that goes in the form of bonuses to teachers. We don't spend more per student than any place in the country. We're below average. But now the largest voucher program in the country is uh, the program for four-year-olds that get to spend with tax dollars a half day. And we created reading coaches in every elementary school to teach teachers how to teach reading. We ended social promotion in third grade. We created a gate because in fourth grade you're learning, you're reading to learn, and, and prior to that you have to read to be able to do math and science. If you leave fourth grade behind in reading, you have a 12% chance of ever catching up. So we can't afford as educators to allow children to move through kindergarten through third grade and go into fourth grade behind in reading. Because when we do that, we doom them to a really difficult life, to challenges in trying to secure employment and provide for their families. So about 20 years ago, Florida passed a law that required every student before they go on to fourth grade to demonstrate a level of mastery in foundational reading skills. But at the same time that the policy changed, there was a huge investment um, by the state and by the feds in helping our teachers understand those practices and how to put them into action in their classrooms and as a school. And I think the policy coupled with that investment in relearning was so important. The change in policy challenged our beliefs and assumptions. If we just pass kids along or hope they get better over time, they don't. Question, let me ask you, would you rather send your children to a school that has more resources and poor quality education, or would you send your children to a school that does not have the best physical resources, but has the best quality education that is going to prepare your child for life, a lifelong learner? Where would you rather do? The schools that are in the underprivileged neighborhoods, the zip code schools, they, they do have more funding. I would love to have those resources, but history tells us those resources have not made much of a difference. If it would have, if funding would have made a big difference in the schools that are in these neighborhoods, then we would have seen different results. Have we seen different results? No, we have not. Maybe just a little bit, but if you give them choices, so about whether that school is the right fit for the child. Yes, funding is important. I want more funding, but choices are more important. Accountability is more important. When we looked at, at educational reform, educational options, we look at outcomes. Florida has made a difference while Kansas were staying the same. Kansas really didn't do much, if anything, in terms of embracing any of those reforms. And as a result, our student performance results have uh, been fairly flat or stagnant. Not to say that all Kansas kids are failing. There are a lot of kids that are doing great. But what about the children uh, who don't have that opportunity. If, if a child is going to a, a failing school, and let's say uh, they've had nine months at that school, and every day they're going there and they're getting the same thing every day. Uh, by the end of that nine months, I don't believe that that child is gonna be any better. And I believe that's where a lot of children are when they stay in a failing school for a whole year. At the end of that school year, they're probably not educationally alive. 
So if a child is not reading by third grade, reading proficiently by third grade, they begin to fail in other areas. Reading, most important thing, uh, you have to learn how to read to do anything. It cripples a child for the rest of their life for them to not be reading by third grade. Social promotion was a big deal from the, that was one of the reasons I got it, because they graduate high, students from high school without being able to read and write at grade level. Obviously, the best answer is we need to be able to change what we're doing so that they're not held back and they're on grade level at the very beginning. We need to solve the problem before it ever becomes a problem. Supposedly, the, the diplomas that uh, students are getting out of high school uh, is, is a statement to that student and their parents that your son or daughter is college or career ready. Uh, and yet we know that that's not true. We know that from talking to the regents who, who have to uh, uh, provide remedial coursework before they can even start their um, baccalaureate track. We know that from talking to employers who say they just want somebody who will show up on time and can read a instruction manual and, and do some basic things. From time to time, I've had trouble finding people to be employed. One of the pharmaceutical companies was trying to, to build a facility in McPherson. And they needed a few hundred employees. They were bemoaning the fact that they couldn't find those employees. The state of Kansas needs approximately 20 to 22 percent of our jobs to have a bachelor's, master's, or PhD. 20, 22 percent. The rest need some kind of training. If the people don't get involved, if the CEOs don't get involved, the, the uh, personnel directors and absolutely say, we must have not only bachelor's, master's, PhDs, but also the certificates. And they need to have that within 18 months after high school, 12 to 18 months after high school. If they aren't pushing on that hard, I think they're derelict because that needs to happen. There is, and the only way for that to happen is for a student to be focused on what they want to do while they're still in high school. To spend over $14,000 per student and to see the gap between spending and the results that we're getting wide and spending going up, scores remaining the same. Uh, I, I believe that there, there's a problem when someone is asking for more money and you're getting the same results. Just throwing more money uh, at schools without any accountability and without uh, good policy that has been proven to be successful in other states isn't gonna get the job done. We're spending over half of our budget on K-12 education and yet we're not getting much in the way of uh, results. Kansas as a state, I think, has done a good job of funding the problem with, uh, with, with what's going on in Kansas is the allocation of those resources. The schools have not been putting the money where it really needs to be placed, and that is in instruction. Barely half of every dollar uh, that the state and the legislature sends to the schools gets spent on instruction, and the results uh, and student performance outcomes show that. The schools go to court to get more and more funding without any accountability and with fighting every reform that goes along with that funding. A Supreme Court in Kansas in 2005 broke with precedent and decided that they had a role to play in determining how much money should be spent on schools. Ultimately, the legislature did uh, appropriate the funds that the court wanted, but we put some policies in place and, and one of those policies was that we need to target the money where the money is really needed and that those are the kids that are, that are not proficient, that are at risk. We were concerned that not enough money for instruction was being uh, utilized by the schools. So we had a state policy put in place. 65% of funds should go for instruction. At the time, there was only about 55% going in. Since that time, we've never gotten to 65%. The cumulative effect over the last approximately 15 years of not getting to 65% and having that actual percent go from 55 to around 51 is a loss of about $8.6 billion to the classroom. That's money that the legislature appropriated. That's money that the school spent, but they spent it on something other than instruction. That is heartbreaking and unforgivable in my estimation. Does anybody think that 
at schools spending billions and billions of dollars and, and only putting about 50 cents on the dollar into instruction is a good idea. But the biggest impediment to reform in Kansas has been a combination of factors, not the least of which is a mentality by the public school system of a monopoly. It, it's, they, they think every kid is theirs and every kid should be in their classrooms. And we're expecting four or 500 students to fit into this, this system that has been created. When you got four or 500 different personalities, you got four or 500 different ways that, that children learn, but the current system is they must all fit into this. No matter what their learning style is, no matter where they are in their educational journey, that somehow they believe that every child fits into this same box. And I believe that's what's caused a lot of problems in the public school system. That's what's caused a lot of absenteeism. That's what's causing parents to not be happy with it. And it's causing parents now to really begin to seek out different ways of educating their children. The education community, for the most part, when they hear the word school choice, they're, they're against it. And yet we do have school choice in Kansas. We have school choice for those who can afford it. The kids that really need it, it's the kids who are identified as at risk, generally speaking, are lower socioeconomic. Their parents do not have the wherewithal and the means to move their child to another learning environment. And that's discrimination. And it's really sad because their schools also are challenged uh, to get these kids uh, to proficiency. They're the very ones that ought to have the opportunity as students in Florida have uh, had the opportunity to move to either a, a, a successful public school or, or a private school. There are some real sacrifices being made by parents who really want their children to have a great education and have a great future. They're working, they have jobs, maybe not as good jobs as they'd like, but out of that job, they're, they're paying taxes. When they spend money, they're paying taxes. Part of that money is going toward education. And for them to have to pay twice, I believe it's, it's very unfair because they chose a different path for their child when the money is already there for their child. And the answer is, is that the money follows the child. If the money is already there, it should go where the child, where the parents say that the child is going for their educational journey. The people need to be involved, parents, grandparents, and at some level, business owners do. If they will get the attention of particularly the governor, but leadership in the legislature and say, we cannot find employees to be able to do the job that needs to be done. Consequently, we're going to move our facilities to North Carolina or South Carolina or somewhere. We're going to move them somewhere. If that doesn't get the attention of the powers that be, I don't know what would. Well, first we've got to understand you're not competing with the student in the desk next to you. We live in a global economy. There's children in other countries. And you're competing with that child uh, for a, a job, an opportunity, a scholarship. Now, that child in Florida, they have better educational options than that child in Kansas. They have a better chance of succeeding. They have a better chance of getting into that university, getting that scholarship. Kansas is, is holding uh, it, it's, its students up, it's holding up its workforce, it's holding up it, its, its college institutions, it's holding up its athletic programs, it's holding up a lot of things by not doing educational reform. You know, we have children that come out of the public school and unfortunately uh, they come out of failing schools. And for them to be at Urban Prep and to have an opportunity to, to get a great education, even have a brand new beginning, uh, it, it brings a lot of happiness to the family. Kids are excited about coming to school and most of all, they're excited about learning. 
One of the things that, that keep us going is as just like this morning, we came and we opened the doors and there were families outside. There were children getting out of cars, children getting out of vans, and they came in with smiles on their faces. And some of them came in a little tired, a little down. And you have those conversations with them. And then we get the morning motivation and kids are ready. And they say, let's do this. I'm ready to do this. Uh, that, that gives you hope. Uh, that gives you strength. But you know what? I'm going back and I'm going to fight again for these children. I teach because there's so many students who are in need, who really inspire me, um, who work really hard. and. I love to see when students catch on to something and have that light bulb moment. There are a lot of great teachers, uh, administrators, uh, people in, in, the, in the public school system that I believe they sincerely care about children and, and they want children to succeed. I believe that in them, they know that something is wrong here. And today you see superintendents of these large school districts that are proud of the fact that Florida is leading the way in terms of rising student achievement. They're embracing it. Most teachers embrace it. Uh, there's been a change in mindset that is pretty dramatic. The families that I've seen that have taken advantage of those opportunities um, to choose where their child can be ed educated um, have been so grateful for that and um, have been so proud of the successes that they've seen in their students. Um, so I think it's incredibly important to have those options. And so it's just common sense to me to align everybody's interest towards more, more of what we want, which is rising student achievement. And uh, there should be financial rewards for the teachers that do extraordinary work. Every school that is an A or shows improvement gets $100 per student. And 90% of that goes in the form of bonuses to teachers. Now the NEA and their, their state affiliates don't, don't always like that. They like to collectively bargain all this. Um, they want the power on top of their teachers. But teachers appreciate the fact that they're being rewarded for a job well done. The largest tax credit uh, scholarship program, which was implemented in my second year, now has, I think, 120,000 low-income kids. Those families um, now march on Tallahassee, if you will, and make sure that the legislators that represent them, predominantly African-American Democrat representatives, uh, know that it's, this is a very important program. So uh, over time, there is now uh, the garnering of support in the places which you really want. You want to create a constituency of reform amongst mom and dads. Parents should have a say about where their taxpayer dollars go. My belief is that money should go with the child. So over time, um, we, we did have one news, statewide newspaper, uh, large newspaper, be supportive in Jacksonville, but generally people were opposed to this to begin with in the press. The teachers union was opposed to it. The school boards were opposed to it. Um, the, the blob, if you will, was opposed to it. You had opposition from the teachers union. You had opposition from time to time from parents. It was amazing. I can't tell you the number of letters we got written by school children it was obvious they wrote them in class. And the worst part of it was I wanted to correct their grammar and their spelling and write back to their teacher and say, is this what you're teaching? The issue of education is um, very political because in, in many school districts, many cities, many towns particularly, the school districts are the largest employers. And so the focus inevitably gets to the economic interests of the adults. We had dramatic reform, and the adults had done pretty good. The idea that somehow you're, you're going to destroy public education by embracing choice or accountability has just not been proven in Florida. The more competition we had in education, the better off we became. Uh, so I, for one, believes, believe that competition is good in this. But you will hear those who say, oh no, you're making the public schools compete with, with others. Well those children are gonna to have to go out and compete with others in the workaday world. So I, I think you need to reframe the conversation to say the objective of public education is to assure that children get a year's worth of knowledge in a year's time and do that successively over the K-12 experience rather than focusing on the retiree benefits of people who, um, 
who are, are doing quite well in the system and they're, they're still going to do fine. But we had success. That was the key. The key was to implement these ideas faithfully and have rising student achievement. The bigger the idea, the more you have to build um, a coalition uh, of like-kind people that might be different in every other aspect. And we did that. Uh, we didn't have huge support amongst Democrats, but we had enough support to, uh, to validate the idea. Uh, we had support from the business community. We had support amongst good teachers, great teachers that weren't threatened by accountability. In fact, they embraced it and wanted to see it. Uh, we had support among parents that wanted more choices, particularly lower income parents that are assigned schools in basically all across this country. And so we built a coalition that was helpful. But I'll be honest with you, if you don't have a political leader willing to take the political risk uh, to, to, to advocate big things and then to implement it in a uh, intellectually honest way, a faithful way to the ideas that, uh, that can yield a good result, you're not going to get um, the benefits of reform. You have to be all in. Uh, success you know, in, in these things is never final. Reform's never complete. You have to constantly be pushing forward and we've had good governors that have continued these reforms working with really reform-minded legislators. Now there's a constituency for these reforms that'll make it hard for it to turn back. We all have the same goal in mind. We want our Kansas kids to be educated. We want them to have opportunities. We want them to feel good about staying in the state. We want them to feel like that they've had a good education. If we could get rid of uh, this litigation environment and this adversarial type of environment, I think we could come together and, and, and really make some good reforms that are gonna help everybody. You can, you can find common ground with the institutional forces that resist reform. But the other thing that's important is if you're elected to an office, a state house or state senator or governor or any position of responsibility, what are you doing if you're not reforming the things to assure that the next generation has a fighting chance in this incredibly uh, challenging and competitive world that we're moving towards? If you're not there to serve people and to change the things that are broken, what are you there for? Imagine what the world looks like a decade from now, 12 years from now, when a kindergartner is graduating from a school in Kansas uh, that is capable of either getting a, getting a job that they're career ready or already having under their belt uh, college level work that makes it possible for them to graduate on time for a four year degree. Their dreams are gonna be broad and big. Uh, they're not going to be broad and big if we dumb everything down and have what my brother called the soft bigotry of low expectations. I really am optimistic, but, but we can't let too much time pass or we're gonna lose more and more of our graduates. The money that we spend on a child, more important than the money we spend on reforming that child in prison. I think this is the civil rights issue of our time, it's the economic issue of our times, it's the social justice issue of our time. Political leaders who have the obligation to reform the systems that are so important for the future of their constituencies need to get off the mat and start advocating more meaningful reforms so that there's rising student achievement so that dreams can come true. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your patience in getting this going. I hope you think it was worth your time. Uh, as, the, as the credits roll, I want to bring up uh, uh, your friend and ours, uh, Paul Sutar. We could not have done this without Paul and his team. <clears throat> and I want to let uh, give Paul a chance to give you to talk just a few minutes about uh, some of the efforts that went into this and uh, you know the, the storytelling aspects. Paul? I've, there are several people in the room who uh, 
in 2018 made it possible for me to go out to Los Angeles and attend a, a really great workshop called Lights, Camera, Liberty. And the point they made there is one that our nation's marketing business has known for a long time, is that people don't remember data so much as they remember stories. If you tell somebody a personal story, they remember it and they act on it. So that's what we're trying to do with this. And there's a lot more that can be done with this story and with other stories in Kansas to help people understand how it affects them, how it affects their future. Uh, I have uh, 18 grandkids, 12 of which live in Kansas. That's why I care about this. Um, the cooperation we got from um, Jeb Bush from uh, e Excellence in Education, uh, a woman down there named Cassandra set up appointments for me. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And in four shooting days in Florida, I was able to get everything that you see there from, from Florida. I also want to point out my business partner, uh, Ben Oliver. He's the digital wizard, if you will, and made it look like it does and actually got us working today. So I want to appreciate his efforts. So the, what we hope to accomplish with the video was, one, to educate people, and two, to motivate them, help them see what is possible. Florida went from bottom of the barrel to the top in 20 years. And that sounds like a long time, but when you're moving something that big, it takes time. But the longer we wait in Kansas, the more kids are going to disappear. I don't know if you caught the very end of this. The, the last sequence is a bunch of flakes coming down, sort of reminiscent. I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, Marvel movies where somebody gets Thanos and they <laughs> kind of disappear. Well, that's what happens to our kids. They walk through that school door, they get bored, they don't get the proper education, and they come out. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them even go into college and they get big debt and they come out and they've got nothing. So we need to fix that. I appreciate your time. Um, I'll be up here if anybody has any, uh, any other questions after we're going to have a short question period here. There you go. Thanks. Um, I had a couple more slides I was going to show you, but I'll just go uh, just tell you very briefly. Um, the um, there there are solutions, obviously, um, and and we have them in Kansas. We're going to be introducing some because uh, in in the next couple of weeks, there's actually going to be uh, hearings on some legislation uh, we've proposed in conjunction with a lot of other partners. Uh, and these things do come together. It's, there's partnership. I mean, you get you get to benefit from seeing people like Paul, and you see George and Martin here, and uh, and and we love coming here. But there's this is a national movement. There are over 60 organizations like ours around the country, and then there's other national organizations that we all plug into. So this this is a real partnership effort, uh, and we were delighted to be able to bring this to you because we have some very very serious education problems here in Kansas. Statewide, you saw there 49% of the kids uh, in the 10th grade are below grade level. Uh, here in Wichita, there's a handout uh, that shows it's over 60% in the Wichita School District. And, and, and this is, uh, it, you know, it's a little bit worse in Wichita, but there's no place in Kansas that it's good. Uh, you know, the Johnson County, you know what it's like in Johnson County. They look down here on Wichita like they know everything, and, and uh, uh, the folks in Wichita don't know what they're doing. But Johnson County has challenges, uh, and they don't like to hear it. Um, the, uh, and and, and this, this is a true story, and this is, this is why it's so important that, that we get this done. Uh, I'm on the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce uh, Government Affairs Committee. Uh, they'll eventually have to change the rule because all you have to do is join up and ask and they, they'll put you on. So they're, uh, I think they're, they're thinking about that twice now. But um, So uh, we had a conversation at one of the Government Affairs Committee about uh, education. And it was all about the money, of course. And I said, well, what, what about accountability? How about we do something, encourage the legislature to hold accountable because we have some real challenges here. And you should have seen the uproar in that meeting. I mean, the, 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 the men and women in that room, most of them were like, we don't have a challenge. One guy actually slammed his book and got it and left the room because we don't have those problems in Johnson County. <laughs> so I'm just giving them the data. And I said, based on this, because like, right, Blue Valley, okay, supposed to be the best. 21% of the kids in Blue Valley are below grade level in math in the 10th grade. And so I said, based on this, we know across Kansas and right here in Johnson County, 
We're graduating kids from high school who are below grade level. We know it. Now, you know what makes that a really powerful story? Two of the people in that room were the superintendents of Olathe and Shawnee Mission, and they didn't say a peep. I was waiting for it. I was ready. They couldn't wait for the conversation. They know it. But as Governor Bush said, it's really about the economic interest of the adults. And that's why it's so important. We wanted to bring this story out to really provide the hope and, and also to give Reverend Moore his acting debut. But <laughs> so yes, we, yes, we can take some questions. We're going to go over about five minutes. If you have to go to work, please do. We think this is real important. Okay. You heard it. Anybody have a question they want to answer very quick? Okay. We have a hand up. Here it is. Has this presentation been given to Governor County? <laughs> <laughs> Big tongue in cheek. Um, no, it has not, but she will be getting an opportunity. We're going to be sharing this. Uh, we're going to actually be taking this around the state uh, and showing it in theaters and, and inviting people to come out for a free screening. We're going to be showing it in the legislature. She'll certainly be invited. Uh, I, I doubt that she'll show. She has shown for all of her claims of bipartisanship, she has slammed, well, she didn't slam the door. She never even opened the door to people with a different viewpoint. But we'll certainly make it available to her. Our Wichita Rotary Club referred to the downtown Rotary Club. It happens to be the 16th largest Rotary Club in the world out of 32,300 clubs. We for, I know I've been reading in the schools here in Wichita for 17 years and what our Rotary Club. And we read, we used to read three times, but now we've expanded to 23 schools. They're, they're Title I schools. And each one time we read, uh, we've given the children the opportunity to actually select a book that and then we, we actually then give that book to them. But I, well, my disappointment is I see not much increase in ability in the schools here. No, there's not. It's, it's, it's actually getting a little bit worse. And, and, you know, for all those good intentions, things like literacy programs, uh, we, we've tried those things over and over again. The problem is we're not getting, the kids aren't getting the basics. And that's, that, that, it's not the teacher's fault. That starts at the head. That's the school board and that's the administration uh, because they refuse to change. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Joseph uh, Elmore and I'm a substitute teacher in uh, two bad man. And everything you said is true, but the kid between uh, grade school and high school, they have no incentive. They're sitting there uh, knowing you can't uh, uh, kick them out, uh, uh, force them to do anything because there's no kids out behind, I guess. But uh, you're right, I don't know what we need to do, but uh, I'd like to be a part of whatever mission is. Thank you. Thank you. Well, th there's a couple things that can be done, and that's one of the bills that we're introducing. It's an education savings account. Basically, it's a money follows the child program so that any child across the state who's below grade level on the state assessment is allowed to leave and take their money wherever they want to go because nothing gets the attention of local school board members like the thought of losing money. I'd like to know what you think the greatest opposition is to uh, school boards and, uh, and the funding following the child. And uh, how, do you, how do you count that? There's, there's two, that's a great question. What's the greatest opposition? There, there's two things. Um, a false sense of high achievement is one of the biggest barriers we face. Uh, because honestly, if people think we have a good education system, then why would you want to change it? And then the, the school, uh, the blob, if you will, to quote Governor Bush, is saying, look, if you, you know, choice is going to defund schools. That's what this really is about. It's not. It's about funding the students and getting the students educated. So the other opposition is the unions, is the school boards, is the economic interest of the adults in the system. Uh, they know that kids aren't getting educated. 
but I mean, even to the point there was a legislative post audit result that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago that found that, by the way, you all helped make happen, uh, and that's a longer story, uh, but uh, it said that the schools are not following the law. I mean, not even trying to follow the law, spending over $400 million directed for the low-income kids. And the state school board uh, president wrote an editorial basically saying, shut up, go away, we know what we're doing. Well, I, I, I respectfully disagree with that. Yeah, what, let, me, let me interject something there real quick. Um, you mentioned about the Rotary Club. The, the things that I see as the biggest problems is ignorance. People don't know this problem exists. The next one is monopoly. The school system has effectively a monopoly on the system. And the third is apathy. People just aren't doing anything about it. So I would encourage, if you have a group that you're involved in, set up a showing for this. Call KPI and say, we'd like to have you come show this. And then send people to the school board, to the school board meetings, and invite them to watch this, this video. Get them involved in it, and get people to actually start making a change. Because I, I think that's the, the route we're going to have to take. Yeah, in fact, you want to have some fun? Go ask the Rotary Club to show this. <laughs> Just real quickly, for those of us that don't know completely, explain how uh, Bishop Moore can uh, fund his school and why there are not more schools like you. Oh, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, Bishop Moore's uh, school, uh, I think virtually every, if not every, student attends on a tax credit scholarship. It's the only school choice program that exists in Kansas. Uh, and, and so you can, you can donate to a scholarship granting organization and get a 70% state income tax credit for your donation. And then that money is used to fund scholarships for kids to go. Uh, of course, we had to fight like cats and dogs to get that passed in 2014. And every year since then, the blob has tried to shut it down because they don't want kids in Wade School to do better. They want them stuck in the schools that they know will leave those kids behind. Uh, my name is David Lewis. I'm going to be running for the school board in about two years, unfortunately. I got into the wrong point. Uh, my daughter teaches math in high school here, and unequivocally, her biggest problem are teaching those who are underqualified, and even worse, the ones that are not motivated. They stop the children who can learn from learning. What are we going to do? And you see, that's not an easy solution. We can always come up with feel-good solutions when there's an easy feel-good solution, but it's a difficult solution. What do we do with these kids? Well, that's a great question, and it starts at the school board, because the only reason that kids are being coddled and allowed to get away with things that you know, people our age wouldn't even think about is because school boards have chosen to do that. They are not obligated. Those are choices by local school boards. I'll give you a great example. Uh, we do A through F grading. We put grades on every public building in Kansas based on their state assessment results. In Kansas City, Kansas, there's five high schools. Four of them get Fs. One gets a B. It's the only large high school in Kansas that gets a B. Now what, and, and these are all 70, 80 percent low income kids in every building. The difference between the one that gets a B is in order to be in that school, you have to have a good grade point average, you have to have a good attendance record, and you have to have and keep a good behavior record. It's accountability. It works. Let me add a little bit there. There, there are... There are several hours of video that I didn't get squeezed into this 36 minutes in which uh, people like uh, Linda Hayes, uh, for example, uh, at Florida State University uh, talked about how exactly what you were asking works. And to make a, a shortcut to it, it's choice and focusing on the individual student's education. It's like Wade Moore said, we, don't, we can't put them all in the same box. Kids learn individually and independently. And so that needs to change right there at, at, the, at the very basic level in order for us to have some effective education here in Kansas. Let's give Dave Trevor some